Maybe Joey Manifoli was going soft, but he pitied the old man. Tall and stooped as if under a great weight, his roomy eyes brimmed behind the lens of his horn-rimmed glasses. He looked like he was about to cry. His mustache, dull, sandy brown just a month ago, had gone completely gray, and the lines in his narrow face seemed deeper, sharper. His white coat hung slack on his gaunt frame, and his black bow tie drooped like a wilted flower. His naughty hands trembled slightly, as if with Parkinson's, and his Adam's apple bobbed up and down. His voice came in a low, frog-like croak, and speaking was visibly difficult. If a man had ever been down on his luck, it was Lenny Watterson. Next month, he said. I, I swear, I just, I have to bury my wife. They were standing in the middle of the Watterson's pharmacy on Leeford's Boulevard. The black and white checkerboard tiles gleamed in the light of the September sun, and the scent of cinnamon lingered in the air like a pleasant sepia tones memory. Lenny slipped his hand under his glasses to pinch the bridge of his nose, and a strange and uncharacteristic pang of sympathy cut through Joey's stomach. Short and squat, with graying black hair combed neatly back from a broad forehead and clad in a plaid sports coat that made him look like a used car salesman instead of a mobster, Joey wasn't a man who often empathized with people. In his line of work, you can't or you won't last a week. You gotta be cold, and you gotta be hard. The motto around the suite from which his crew operated was, fuck you, pay me. And it was fitting. Money makes the world go round, and if you're not being paid, your world stops. Normally, if someone gave him a sob story like Lenny Watterson's, he'd nod, express his condolences, then hold out his hand. Now fuck you, pay me. Things were different with the old man, though. Lefferts, and most of Queens itself, had changed a lot over the past twenty years, but Watterson's had been here through it all, like a rock. Seventy-eight, Lenny had been running the place since as far back as Joey could remember, and probably longer. Joey appreciated that. Nothing lasts anymore, and when something does, it deserves some kind of respect. He also saw a lot of himself in Lenny. They were both old partners in industries steadily fading away. You saw pharmacies and soda fountains nowadays less than you saw three-eyed aliens, and this thing of ours, that wasn't what it used to be either. The old heads were dead or in prison, the Sicilians ran everything, and the old ways of making money didn't always work. Take extortion. A lot of guys used to make good money doing that because, back then, the mob was strong. You didn't call the cops, because if you did, you were fucked. Now, three little numbers on the keypad could send fifty guys away for decades. Watterson was a special case. Nominally, Joey collected three hundred dollars every month for protection. Protection from what he'd do to the place if the old man didn't pay. But deep down, it was blackmail. Watterson, you see, liked little girls. Really, little girls. Joey never threatened to expose him, but he made sure he knew up front that he could. I'll pay you next month, I swear. Watterson repeated. Joey put his hands on his hips and sighed. He glanced at the boy on his left, tall and lanky with black hair and an olive complexion just like Joey's. He wore jeans and a black zip-up hoodie. He stared down at his white tennis shoes and looked like he'd rather be anywhere but here. Last year, Joey's brother and his wife were killed in a car crash, and Bobby came to live with him. He was a good kid, but too goddamn lazy, so Joey had been showing him the ropes. That way, maybe he'd make something of himself one day. Showing a mark of mercy would set a bad example, but he couldn't bring himself to go hard. Not on Lenny. He couldn't walk away empty-handed, though. All right, all right, fine, Joey said, and gestured with his hands. Look, I'm fair. We've been doing this a long time, and you've always been good about paying. So here's what I'm gonna do. 
Watterson swallowed thickly and braced himself. I'll waive the payment, and this payment only. But come on, you gotta give me something. The old man nodded. Whatever you want. What do you got? Watterson opened his mouth, then closed it again. I, 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 I don't really have anything, he said. I, I... Recognition flickered in his eyes. Joey could read people well enough to know the old man had thought of something. What? Joey asked. Well, I, I have an old arcade cabinet in the basement. My brother gave it to me before he died. Samuel Watterson ran a junk shop out in Brooklyn for 30 years before retiring. He went to storage locker auctions like those assholes on TV and bought shit for cheap, then turned around and sold it for as much as he could. Another crew out in Flatbush put the squeeze on him, and a couple of the guys used to accept crap from his store in lieu of money. Their captain reamed them out for it, too. Arcade cabinet, Joey said, tasting the words like they were strange and new. You mean like an arcade game, right? Watterson nodded. Yeah, I was gonna set it up here, but I never got around to it. When he was a kid, Joey and his friends used to hang out in an arcade in Maspeth, a dark, cave-like place filled with beeping, flashing lights and girls. He stopped fucking around with video games when his nuts dropped, but from what little he knew, some of those old games were worth a lot of money now. Let me see it. Joey said. Watterson led them down a brief hallway past the bathrooms and the office, Joey close behind and Bobby bringing up the rear, at a door with employees only on it. Watterson stopped and produced a key from his pocket. It worked the last time I checked it, he said over his shoulder. That was three years ago, so I can't promise anything. He unlocked the handle and opened the door. The hinges creaked, and the stale smell of mildew pinched Joey's nose. Watterson reached in, snapped an overhead light on, and carefully defended a set of rickety wooden stairs, one hand trailing along the unfinished banister. At the bottom, the walls were stone and the floor earth. Thick layers of dust coated everything, and cobwebs danced like phantoms in shadowy corners. Boxes lined one wall, and broken stools, chairs, and tables were heaped here and there like the aftermath of a miniature tornado. The game sat in an alcove around a corner, covered in a white canvas tarp. For some reason, Joey was reminded of bodies in the morgue. Bobby, hands thrust sullenly into his pockets, stood next to Joey while Watterson yanked the tarp off. Motes of dust swirled in the air and made Joey's eyes water. This is it, Watterson said, and tossed the tarp aside. Joey walked over to inspect it. Six feet tall at a glance, it looked like every arcade game Joey had ever seen. Screen, marquee over the monitor with the game's title on it, and a control panel with buttons and joysticks. There was no artwork on the sides like you'd expect, only a grid pattern consisting of black lines on a silver background. The lettering across the marquee was blocky and light blue. Primus, it read. Never heard of it. Walking slowly around it, Joey checked for obvious signs of damage, but didn't see any. He spotted a cord lying in the dirt and picked it up. You got an outlet down here? Oh, one sec... While Watterson went off to find an extension cord, Joey looked up at Bobby, who studied the cabinets with mild interest. You ever heard of this game? He shook his head. No. Watterson returned with an orange cord, and Joey jammed the plug into it. The marquee lit up. Soft, electric shimmer, then the screen. Primus flashed across it. Below that, L... 1981 MK Tech. Credit. One. Hey, there we are, Joey said. He dug in his pocket for a quarter 
and dropped it into the slots with a metallic and strangely satisfying chink. He pushed play, and a green vector lines streaked across the screen. A star-shaped thing formed in the center, and a tiny triangular spaceship appeared on the left. Joey hit a button, and the craft fired at the star, which began to spin. A low, buzzing sound filtered from unseen speakers, and Joey's fillings vibrated, making him wince. It works? Orison asked. The star spun faster, and Joey stared into it, mesmerized. Without warning, it fell away, and a confusion of polygons, prisms, and hallucinogenic spirals took its place. The buzzing grew louder, more insistent, and Joey's heart began to inexplicably race. Something wasn't right. He forced his eyes from the screen, and black dots filled his vision. He blinked and shook his head a headache already smoldering above his left eye. Are you all right? Watterson asked, worriedly. I'm fine, Joey said, and pressed his hands to his temple. That shit hurts my eyes. Almost gave me a seizure or something. A loud ringing echoed through his ears, and his stomach twisted. For a second, he was dizzy. Then, as suddenly as it came, it was over. I'll take it he said, and patted the machine. I'll come back later and pick it up. Watterson's shoulders lifted a little, and he gave an eager nod. I'll be here, he said. Outside, the sun shone, and exhaust fumes choked the mild breeze. Cars honked, a siren wailed in the distance, and people made their way up and down the sidewalks. Joey lit a cigarette, and Bobby whipped out his cell phone. I don't know how you can look at those screens all day, Joey said. Two seconds and I got a fucking headache. The pain above his eye had faded, but he could still feel it, a pinprick of heat boring into his skull like a laser. Before playing Primus, he was hungry, but now the thought of food sent his stomach gurgling. When he blinked, whirls and stars burst across the backs of his eyelids, and his head spun. This is why I don't work a desk job, he pointed out. Bobby didn't reply. At the car, Joey slid in behind the wheel with a grunt, and Bobby climbed into the passenger seat. For a moment, they sat in silence, the smoke from Joey's cigarette heavy in the air. I don't usually do that, Joey said at last. But I made an exception. Without looking up from his phone, Bobby nodded. You get sob stories every time you collect, but I've known Lenny a long time, and he's not lying. His wife really did just die, and I get why he's got to skip this time. A defensive edge crept into his voice, and hot shame spread across the back of his neck. Bobby was quiet. Joey turned to look at him. He wore an absent expression and darted his eyes from side to side across the screen. Joey was good at reading people, and his nephew was uninterested in what he was telling him. That irritated Joey. Hey, he said sharply. Can you look at me and not at that fucking phone? Bobby looked up with strained patience. I'm getting real sick of your attitude, Joey said, and threw the car in drive. You need to start paying attention to what I'm showing you. You might think it's a fucking joke right now, but one day you're not going to have me wiping your ass and buying you Xboxes and shit. You're going to have to make your own money. This is how you do it. For a moment, Bobby looked like he was going to mouth off, but he simply nodded and mumbled something that might have been okay. Shaking his head, Joey pulled away from the curb and set a course for the suite. A nightclub with a sleek, stylish facade and situated off the main drag. It was owned by Anthony Tony Rossiti, a captain so fat his roles had roles. Joey and the other guys called him Tony Tits behind his back and Sir to his face. In the daylight, the inside was dim and empty save for a few guys at the bar, all members of the crew. Joey sat next to Steve DeFano and waved the bartender over. 
a perky blonde with long legs and pink lips. She brought him a rum and coke, and Bobby just a coke. Tony in? He asked Steve. No, he's out, Steve said, a tall, broad man with a mustache. Steve owned a moving company that the crew used to launder money. Joey knocked back his drink. You think you can help me out with something? He said. What? Steve asked. An hour later, Joey stood on the sidewalk before Watterson's with his arms crossed and supervised as Steve and Ray Mancini wheeled Primus out on a dolly. A white moving truck sat illegally parked at the curb, and people passing in the streets had to move over to avoid it. Because they were New Yorkers, every single one of them honked for the hell of it. The cabinets, covered once more by the tarp, leaned back against the handcart, and as they got it over the threshold, it started to tip. Watch it, Joey started. Steve caught it before it could fall and Joey walked alongside, hand out, to stop it if it fell again. Grunting, straining, and sweating, Steve and Ray got it up the ramp and sat it against the far wall, then wrapped ratchet straps around it to keep it from falling during the drive. I didn't know you liked video games, Ray said, a mocking hilt in his voice. Yeah, so what if I do? He held his hands up in a placated gesture. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. It just, you know, maybe it's time you grew up and got your head out of your ass. Steve snickered, and Bobby turned his head away to hide his smile. Just shut up and do what I told you. Joey lived in a nondescript house on a quiet side street in Far Rockaway. It was two stories, brick and set tastefully back from the sidewalk. Steve backed the truck into the yard, then he and Ray wheeled the cabinet around back. Joey went ahead to unlock the basement door. Instead, the floor was heavily carpeted with a pool table in the middle. A dartboard hung catty corner from the couch, and a flat screen TV took up most of one wall. He and the other guys played pool and poker down here on occasion. He had Steve and Ray set the cabinet next to the stairs and only realized later that there was an outlet nearby. After Steve and Ray left, Joey stood before the game with his hands on his hips and stared at his watery reflection in the darkened screen. His fillings ached at the memory of its buzz and the pain in his head returned. The compulsion to turn the cabinet on gripped him and his heartbeat sped up. For a moment, he almost did. Then he ripped himself away and went upstairs instead. Just after six that evening, Joey poured pasta into a strainer in the sink, set the pot down, and stirred the sauce. It spat and splattered his arm, burning him. He picked up the strainer, shook it, dumped the pasta back into the pot, and set it on the stove. Next, he took a loaf of Italian bread from the bread box next to the microwave and cut it into slices. He worked with the grace and ease of a ballerina, as at home in the kitchen as he was beating a guy's face in with the handle of a thirty-eight. His movements were fluid, his steps fleet. In a wife beater that stretched tight across his gut and bared his hairy arms, he resembled a bear but mimicked a rabbit. When the sauce was done, he turned the stove off and set it aside, then grabbed a plate from the cabinet over the sink. He forked a generous amount of pasta, drowned it in sauce, and added a piece of bread, and set it on the table. He did it again, then went into the living room where the TV played unwatched, and the lamplight cast a low, comfortable glow. At the bottom of the stairs, he cupped his hands to his mouth. Food's ready. He waited until he heard Bobby moving around, then went back into the kitchen and sat, the chair creaking under his weight. A few minutes later, Bobby trudged in like his feet weighed five hundred pounds apiece and took his spot. His eyes were hazy and unfocused, and his hair stuck out at odd angles, putting Joey in mind of those troll dolls that were big when he was a kid. You were sleeping, weren't you? Joey asked. Yeah, 
Bobby said. I was tired. You need to stop staying up all goddamn night on that computer, Joey said, and took a bite. It'll turn your mind to mush. I feel kind of sick, that's all. The boy mumbled and picked up his fork. That was a lie. He stayed up until two or three in the morning playing games or going on 4chan or whatever kids do. A vision of Primus came back to Joey, and his chest closed like a feeble fist. Something wasn't right with that cabinet, and after dinner he was going to go downstairs and check it out some more. For a while they ate in silence. The only sound was the scraping of forks on plates. Then Joey took a drink. You asked that girl out yet? A deep blush spread across Bobby's face, and Joey couldn't contain a grin. Her name was Clara, or Kara, or something like that, and she lived a couple of houses down. Cute little redhead with green eyes and pale skin. She was always following Bobby around like a puppy dog, smiling at him, giggling the works. Bobby said he didn't like her, but he was a goddamn liar. His problem was that he was too damn shy. Eh, not yet, he said. Why not? Joey asked. Bobby shrugged one shoulder. I just, I don't know if she likes me like that. Throwing his head back, Joey laughed. You got a lot to learn, you know that? I can read people, kid. Trust me, she likes you. Wants to hold your hand the way Trump wanted to nuke that fucking hurricane. Bobby's blush turned bright red, and Joey laughed again. He liked picking on his nephew. In a fatherly way, of course. Those Irish girls are wild. I give it five minutes before she's dragging you in her house. Let's go to my room. Bobby choked on his food, and Joey slapped his back. Seriously, though, Joey said, and took a bite of his bread. You should ask her out. Stop being shy and shit. I'm not shy, Bobby argued. Whatever you want to call it, ask her out or you're grounded. He grinned to show that he was playing. After dinner, Bobby did the dishes, then went back up to his room to do God Only Knows, and Joey went into the basement. The cabinet was where he left it, huddled at the foots of the stairs like a cat burglar with his back against the wall, listening. Joey favored it warily, as though it were a coiled snake instead of a video game, and the memory of the buzzing returned. Despite bitching and moaning about cell phones and computers, Joey owned one of each and used them frequently. Neither one made him feel like he was going to pass out the way Primus did, and though he kept it under wraps, he was a little worried. He blamed the game earlier, but maybe something was wrong with him. He was 53 and overweight with high cholesterol, the perfect candidate for a stroke. He didn't know much about strokes, but maybe the flashing lights and teeth-rattling hum of the cabinet triggered something. He sucked his bottom lip into his mouth and considered his next move. Part of him wanted to go back upstairs and forget about it, but another wanted to plug the game in and play it. Just to see. If something was the matter with him, he needed to know about it. After an indecisive moment, he bent over, picked up the plug, and jammed it into the outlet. The marquee kicked in, and the air crackled with energy, setting his teeth on edge. He stood in front of the screen and stared at it. Primus, L. 1981, MK Tech. Credit, 1. He reached into his pocket, found a quarter, and started to put it into the coin slot, but stopped. Maybe he shouldn't do this. Maybe he should go upstairs, make an appointment with his doctor, and be done with it. The quarter dropped into the machine's guts with a click, and he swallowed. No, he'd just play around and go from there. He hated going to the doctor, and if he didn't have to, he didn't want to. He jabbed the play button with his thumb, and the game started. A tunnel, green lines on black, took shape in the void, and the spaceship, or whatever it was, appeared. Joey frowned in confusion. This was different from the last time he played. Huh. Must be at a different level. 
the ship took off like a rocket, and Joey guided it with a joystick. Every so often, a throbbing light filled the track, and hitting it made the ship go faster. If you touched the wall grids, you slowed down, and if you slowed down too much, the timer ran out and you lost. It was simple, even for its time, but eh, not bad, he guessed. As he played, Joey felt none of the effects from before. His head didn't spin, his skull didn't ache, and his stomach didn't heave. The buzzing bothered him at first, and after a while it receded to a low drone that settled into his brain. It wasn't bad, actually. It kind of made him sleepy. At the end of the level, You Win flashed across the screen, and Joey smirked. He liked to win. The next stage was different. Points of white light streaked at the player, giving the effect of being on a spaceship and whizzing past stars. None of the buttons did anything, but if you maneuvered the joystick, the screen moved from side to side. Two minutes in, strobing colors rapidly pulsed, and Joey stared into them, unaware that his jaw hung slack or that his eyes had widened as if to see every pixel. The world ebbed away, and all that existed were the lights and the constant hum. When Joey came to, please insert quarter scrolled across the screen. He blinked and shook his head. He felt okay, but suddenly very tired. Eyes grainy, head achy. He pushed away from the cabinet and rubbed his neck. It and his back were both stiff. Upstairs, he got a drink from the fridge and went into the living room. The buzz rang in his ears, and his fingers jittered. Every time he closed his eyes, he could vividly see the screen, and his stomach knotted with something approaching need. On TV, Stephen Colbert sat behind his desk on The Late Show, and Joey's step faltered. What fucking time was it? He pulled out his phone and swiped his thumb across the screen. Almost midnight. Now, his head did spin. It was just after seven when he went downstairs. There was no way he spent five hours standing at that cabinet. His back and neck both twinged in disagreement. He furrowed his brow in thought and racked his brain, sure that he was wrong, but no. He was only down there twenty minutes, maybe half an hour. Yet his phone said it was 11.58. That couldn't be right. He stared down at it, expecting it to magically change, but it didn't. Something eerie seemed to pass close by, and the hairs on his arms stood up. Five hours. He spent five hours down there, and he honestly couldn't remember any of it. A chunk of ice formed around his heart, and he nervously licked his lips. Wasn't losing time like that a sign of having a stroke? In bed, he gazed up at the ceiling, hands folded on his quivering chest, headlights from passing cars darted across the walls, and a quiet hum permeated the atmosphere like electricity before a storm. When he closed his eyes, he saw grids, swirls, and light, and the hot pain in his head swelled. A hot flush crept over him, and his heart palpitated sickly. He glanced at the phone on the nightstand and chewed his bottom lip. If it didn't stop soon, he'd call an ambulance. Some time later, the malaise melted away, and he slipped into a thin slumber. Twinkling lights surrounded him like falling snow, and an ominous buzz steadily increased like an approaching swarm of wasps. Stalks of green light cut through the darkness, forming a prison-like grid and Joey stumbled through it, desperately looking for a way out. The buzzing was louder and louder, worming its way into his head, puncturing his brain, setting every nerve ending on fire. It sounded like whispering voices, and though Joey couldn't make out the words, he understood them. He understood them too fucking well. A thunderclap of agony rocked his skull, and he fell to his knees with a scream. Blood seeped from his eyes, and his nails clawed madly at the sides of his face, ripping skin, tearing veins. 
His eyes bulge from their sockets, inflating like two balloons, and the voices screamed at him, frantic, urgent. The pain was excruciating, and there was only one way to stop it. Staggering to his feet, Joey ran at the wall, and the grid shimmered with dark excitement. He threw himself at it, and just as 50,000 volts surged through his body, he came awake with a gasp. Dusky morning light cascaded through the window, and birds tweeted to each other from treetops the neighborhood over. Joey's eyes stung, and his head throbbed. They were loud. Too loud. He sat up and buried his feverish face in his shaking hands, the dream already dissipating, retreating beyond the rim of remembrance. Something about the game. That fucking game. Uh, Uncle Joey? Joey started so bad, he let out a strangled cry. Bobby frowned at him from the open door, his book bag slung casually over one shoulder. The boy hesitated, perhaps taken aback by his uncle's evident fear, then jerked his head towards the stairs. I'm going now. It was 6.45 by the clock on the bedside table. Joey took a deep, shivery breath. All right. Yeah. Uh, have a good day. Are you all right? Bobby asked. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. Bobby lingered for a second as if he wanted to say something. Then, mercifully, he went away, leaving Joey alone. All right. So something was wrong with him. He couldn't remember the dream. And aside from being shaky and afraid, he felt fine, but that didn't mean shit. A blood clot, cancer, some fucking thing was nestling in his brain, and if he left it alone, it'd flare up, just like it did last night. Like knots crackling in a fire. Picking up the phone, he dialed his doctor's office and made an appointment for ten. Done. He got up, went to the bathroom, and took a long, hot shower the pounding water relaxing his tense muscles. In the kitchen, he made himself toast and drank a glass of orange juice. His eyes darted to the basement door, and he imagined he could feel the cabinet's presence. His hands twitched, and he could feel the ghost of the joystick incessantly prodding his palm, smooth and slick. He closed his hand, and his chest stirred as if with desire. You know... There was a common denominator here. Both times he spaced out, he was playing that damn game. It did something to him. Triggered him. He wasn't saying it was the cabinet's fault, but it primed him. Sparked him. Whatever you want to call it. Now, the urge to play it was bubbling in his mind like fizz. His fingers flexed, his throat went dry, and his midsection fluttered. He finished his juice and went into the living room. Good Morning America was on, and he tried to lose himself in it, but couldn't. It was too hot, too stuffy, the couch too lumpy. He shifted his weight, crossed and uncrossed his arms, tapped his foot. He felt tight, edgy, restive. He wanted to play that game. That admission dislodged a sardonic chuckle from his throat. It was true, though. Primus pulled his blood as surely as the moon pulled the tide. He raked his fingers through his hair and took a deep breath. He couldn't play it. Wouldn't play it. Yet somehow he found himself standing in front of it, the marquee glowing and the screen glinting. Push play, push play, push play. He didn't remember putting a quarter in. Cold sludge sloshed in the pit of his stomach. Sweat trickled down the back of his neck, and his hands lightly trembled as he reached out to press the button. His mind screamed at him to stop, but he did it anyway, guided by some unseen force. The game started, and Joey fell into a vortex of light and sound. Odd, non-geometric, hurled at him from the depths, 
and the buzzing soothed his aching brain, lulling him into a state of near catatonia, like the voice of the wind. He swiveled the joystick and tapped the button with mechanical absence, a machine cycling through the motions. His lips parted, a ribbon of drool coursing down his chin and his eyes glistened. He could almost make out words in the white noise, almost comprehend what the game was telling him. The more he played, the deeper he sank. He could hear the blood crashing in his veins, mice thumping in the walls, traffic on Central Avenue four blocks away. He could smell the hot wires in the machine's body, metallic like ozone. He could feel every pump of his heart, was aware of every bone in his body. The voice became clearer, louder, and commanding. A hand fell on his shoulder, and the illusion shattered. He jumped and whipped around, and Bobby stumbled back in surprise. Disoriented, Joey didn't recognize him at first. What are you doing here? He asked. His voice came as a hollow croak, and he was put uncomfortably in mind of Lenny Watterson. Bobby's brow crinkled. I've... Uh, I've been here, he said, bemused. Vertigo crashed over Joey like a wave, and he studied himself on the machine. What do you mean? Why aren't you at school? Bobby looked at him like he was crazy. School's over, he said. It's five o'clock. Joey missed a beat. It was. He pulled out his phone. 503. I was just wondering if you were going to make dinner. Joey swallowed. In his periphery, the screen winked. Play, play, play. Uh, yeah, Joey said. Uh, give me a minute. Bobby nodded and went back upstairs, and Joey looked at the cabinet. How long had he been here? It felt like only five minutes, but had to be more like six hours, maybe even longer. Like the night before, he couldn't remember any of it, like his mind had been wiped clean. The game called him, and painted with fear. He fled. He was too out of sorts to cook, so he ordered a pizza. He and Bobby sat at the kitchen table. Bobby scarfed down one slice after another, and Joey stared vacantly down at his. The peppers becoming grids, the pepperoni spinning, humming, whining voices. Then she said yes, Bobby grinned. Joey didn't know he was talking. Uh, yeah, uh, that's great, he muttered. He tried to lift his head, but he felt like he was going to topple over and grabbed the edge of the table for support. He's losing it, Bobby thought, and Joey heard it as clearly as if he'd spoken. He looked up, and the boy smiled goofily down at his plate. Going crazy, gonna crack any minute now, old fuck. His lips didn't move but his eyes glowed green. Joey blinked and massaged his temples with his fingertips. Maybe he was. Maybe he was going crazy. Or maybe... Maybe it was that fucking game. No. He was certain. It was the game. Some way, somehow, it was fucking with him. When Bobby was done and in his room, Joey cleared the table, sat and pulled out his cell phone. He went to Google, typed Primus game into the search bar, and hit the spyglass button. The top results was headed. Primus, Urban Legend, Wikipedia. Joey frowned. Urban Legend. He clicked the link and text filled the screen. The attached picture showed the same cabinet currently in his basement. Maybe not the exact same one, but certainly one of them. He started to read. Primus is a fictional arcade game and urban legend that emerged in the late 80s on various Usenet groups. 
the legend claims that an arcade game called Primus suddenly appeared in a Portland, Oregon arcade in November 1981 and caused severe psychoactive effects in players, including dizziness, nausea, nightmares, and eventually insanity. Joey's blood ran cold. The game was said to be part of a CIA experiment related to the MK Ultra project intended to bombard viewers with subliminal messages and psychoactive imagery in anticipation of potential broadcast over Soviet and Eastern Bloc television sets in the event of a war. The phone dropped from Joey's hand with a clunk. Holy shit. Holy fucking shit. He had all of those things. Nausea, nightmares, the works. The article said the game wasn't real, but what the fuck was that downstairs? What was that fucking thing? A hallucination. A fake. A fake. It had to be a fake. It said right in the article it was a legend. Further down, it said people with too much time on their hands made replicas. That's what his had to be. A toy inspired by a myth. Only the things he'd been feeling since yesterday afternoon weren't a myth. And neither was the sudden urge to go downstairs, slip a quarter in, and play. He wanted to play it. Jesus, he could feel it in his bones. A sharp, needling yen, like a drunk craving his favorite poison. Every cell crying out for the comforting lights and sounds. His head slammed, and his chest expanded and contracted with his ragged breathing. His ears rang, and warm, wool-like fuzzies swaddled his brain. A stabbing pain plunged into the center of his stomach, and he doubled over. His arms wrapped around his middle. The buzzing was back, deafening, drowning out everything else. He let out a moan and squeezed his eyes closed. Terror snaked around his heart, and Primus called him like a siren on a rocky shore, luring ships closer, closer, closer. Hugging himself against shudders of agony, Joey went to sit, but bumped into something instead. Primus. Without realizing it, he'd gone into the basement. He stared at the screen, his breath locked in his throat. Primus, L-1981, MK Tech, Credit, 1, MK Tech, MK Ultra.